We're in Amsterdam at the UB Summits, and uh, we're here with. Could you please introduce yourself? <laughs> Josh Goodbody, the general counsel for Huobi in UK. Wow. And uh, actually, UB has uh, just started an office in London. Is that yeah. correct? And uh, with the, for the UK and European branch, or? Indeed. So we established our, our London office about a month ago. Um, that office is from three to eight, soon to be probably about 16. Um, we're expanding at a rate of knots, mm. as you can see. Uh, and that is really with a view to establishing London as the launch pad for the rest of Europe. Cool. So what we establish in London, and, and we've gone into that in our summit today in a bit, a bit of detail, the OTC marketplace and the exchange is all going to be accessible for European users. Mm. So London is a bit like our HQ. Mm. And over the course of this year and next year, we will be expanding slowly but surely into local markets to launch local liquidity pools. So, for instance, a Dutch trader or investor can actually trade in, in, in Dutch. I mean, and uh, people in France, they mm. can uh, trade in Fra uh, French. Uh, or, or is it all in English? Or? Well, I mean, <laughs> I think the question is, what, what do the users want? And predominantly, they're mm. quite comfortable trading in English. Now, some examples you may have seen of localized uh, customized mm. language profiles in, in exchanges. But it's not really something that people have asked us for. Mm. But the good thing about our, 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 our system is that it's very adaptable. So should we want to change the, the skin, i.e. the language, we can very easily do so. Very, very simple for us. So, you know, if, for example, we identify a Italian market to be a large liquidity base, we would absolutely list that in, in Italian. So it also should be said that when we're launching a, a local liquidity pool, that is regulated in that local area. One example, let's say Germany. Mm -hmm. Germany has quite a well-developed uh, framework mm -hmm. and they have a Bitcoin license of sorts. So if we were going to do that, of course it would be in German. So what we're trying to do is ad identify you know, what needs to be done and how it needs to be done in each mm -hmm. jurisdiction. Sounds good. And actually for the European investor, it's quite important to have this, this exchange in Euro as well. Eh? I mean, or, or perhaps also in Pounds, yeah. that you can have your, your gains in, in Euros or Pounds. I think that's right. So when we, when we launch our exchange, which we're planning to do in, in Q4 this year, hopefully sooner than that, but you know, that's, our, that's our long stop, mm. we're going to be providing a fiat deposit channel. And that will allow uh, our clients to deposit GBP, and euros into a proprietary client bank account and that will essentially fund their wallet so the great thing about having that channel is they can withdraw their funds and they're subject to for example in the uk faster payments regime in europe sepa the payments regime so they're same day and that's one of the things that we've same day, same day. so that's one of the key pieces of feedback we've had from people if you're setting up a payment infrastructure make sure you do it in a consumer friendly way we don't want to be waiting five days for these things we don't want to be mm. checking our bank accounts every single day it's got to be user friendly and simple so mm. we are partnering with some very well rated financial institutions they're going to be providing these uh, client deposit accounts uh, it's all going to be fully auditable and we're going to have all the information up on our website so people can see who we're going to be dealing with and we're hoping that that combination of trust and you know a quite client friendly banking service is going to do good for us yeah because I mean uh, regulation is of course a very hot topic uh, how, how is it going actually in the UK with regulation are the do doors open or closed or they're on a, <laughs> how do you say a little <laughs> uh, there's a bit of a gap there there's a gap and they're neither closed nor open um, what I mean by that is there's still a lot of ifs and buts and whens. Mm. There are a lot of questions remaining as to what the future regulatory landscape is going to look like. Mm. And there's good reason for that, because from my perspective, I would always caution against haphazard, quickly done regulations, mm. because they more often than not have unintended consequences. Mm. So what the FCA is trying to do, and I commend them for this, is work through the relevant issues in cryptocurrencies, in exchange technology, in security tokens, in crypto derivatives, in all the various bits of this ecosystem, analyze it all, understand it, and take a position on it. Because you can't just pick up cryptocurrencies and put them in the, for example, financial instruments box as a regulated financial instrument, because that has serious unintended consequences. So the FCA have taken quite a measured approach 
they've come out with small amounts of indicative information, for example, in their Dear CEO letters or their uh, consumer notices where they say, beware ICOs that are X, Y, and Z. They've given us enough of a flavor so that we're pretty confident that at some point there is going to be a regulatory framework brought out by them. We don't know what that's going to look like yet, but we're hoping through ongoing engagement with the industry, which is what they're doing, we're going to get it a good place because what we always believe at Huobi is good regulation is good mm. and we're seeing that we're hoping that momentum continues and sooner than later we'll know and I'm really thinking in Q1 next year we're going to hear this so that's that's what we're hoping for anyway and, and, and can you team up with other exchanges that are active in the UK or Europe or do you have uh, combined forces uh, for yeah I mean? yeah good question I mean you, you've got numerous examples of shall we say collaborative industry working groups trying to either steer or educate the regulator in one direction or another and for the most part they've done a pretty good job so you've got crypto uk which is a i think it's the oldest standing industry body that talks about these kind of regulatory issues and almost sets a common standard and theme within their working groups they do a pretty good job we're looking to work with them at some point in the future as we establish ourselves uh, we're also w working with a initiative called global digital finance this is a uh, global digital finance this is a, uh, a pan-european effort uh, so it's working with the OECD and a number of other governmental bodies to try and work out a universal taxonomy definitions code of conduct and that way, what you're kind of seeing there is a self-regulatory uh, initiative by the industry, which I think is important because just like the FX industry with the FX Global Code last year did it, we're going to be doing that with our own code. And that's the starting point for good practice, shall we say. So you're seeing right in the right and correct steps happening in different places. The key is whether we can all sing from the same hymn sheet. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So, uh, what are actually the challenges? Uh, I mean, if you look at the UK landscape or European landscape on, 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 on a legal and tax perspective uh, from a UB standpoint? The challenges, I think, are staying ahead of competitor frameworks. So, mm. broadly speaking, and I'm going to paint a picture for you here, mm. a cryptocurrency exchange that goes to the UK wishes to offer a GBP or Euro deposit set up for its mm. clients mm. in doing so most exchanges choose to be e-money institutions now e-money institutions are fca regulated mm. they receive money and they issue digital currency okay so that's an fca regulated model in issuing digital currency i.e what sits on your balance after you funded your account yeah. that then can be used to purchase cryptocurrency pairs okay yeah. so that model already exists so you're seeing the UK exchanges stepping up to the plate and self-regulating. They're regulating within the FCA's ambit. Now, there are a couple of things within that that are interesting. They're already on the ladder. They're known to the FCA. They're working within regulated frameworks that they would have to, if there was an upgrading of regulatory, uh, should we say, standards. Mm -hmm. uh, they are subject to a lot of the FCA's so-called conducts of business. So that's a very smart way of future proofing your business because if you're on the ladder already if you need to upgrade your permission you can do so very easily so the back to your question which is what are the challenges well from a uk domestic regulation perspective i think it's understood where we're going mm. but it's making sure that each company is taking the right decision to future proof itself mm. All right. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the, Brexit, the Brexit has happened. So uh, does it have any influence uh, on, I mean, do you have to uh, yeah, combine your forces with the UK and European? I mean, it's, yeah. it's separated. I mean, it's not separated, but... Yeah, I mean. uh, uh, Brexit is the bugbear in the room, right? It's mm. the number one what if mm. for all financial companies in the world. Mm. What do they do? How do they adapt? Do they hedge their bets and create a mitigant solution? Now... In the cryptocurrency world it's even more difficult to try and work out what the impact of that will be mm -hmm. because number one it's not regulated at a pan-european level mm -hmm. there's nothing in pan-european regulation that allows a kind of 
harmony system or recognition system not yet not yet not yet and end of this year they say they might be there might be and if that happens well how does that apply post brexit because we will probably adopt that to get it before brexit what will happen after brexit now my inkling is that the government will realize if it wants to maintain the mantle of being a fintech friendly nation which we say we are mm. that they will want to keep blockchain technologies exchange technologies and cryptocurrency firmly within the uk so it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be something that I think we really have to keep an eye on. Mm. Um, these things move fast in unexpected ways. But I don't think Brexit will have that catastrophic effect that we're all thinking it will. Mm. There will be a level of harmonization that's introduced. There will be a level of uh, anticipatory notifications and news for us to start preparing our business mm. and ultimately we are being quite smart in this respect because what we're doing is launching local localized exchanges in different mm. places so we've got one in london we're going to have a couple in europe mm. by 2019 Depending also in amsterdam probably you never know amsterdam is very possible no i mean on a serious note amsterdam has a wealth of of, of fintech companies it's mm. got a real deep understanding in cryptocurrency technology We've been friendly with Amsterdam for a while, and that's one of the reasons why we're here for the European Quant Training Summit, because the community here gets it, and they get where we're coming from, and they're very much singing the same tune as us. So mm -hmm. Amsterdam really is up, up there on the list, and I think depending on how your regulator chooses or doesn't choose to uh, adopt certain frameworks... Are you in talks with the Dutch regulator? Not at this moment, no. Mm. Not at this moment, no. We're, we're focusing, I'd say, on our, our FCA discussions. Mm. Uh, those are upcoming, so we're going to be kicking those off very soon. So that, for us, sets the tone. Yeah. And then we'll see what we need to do from a, a local regulatory standpoint as we move on. But, you know, Amsterdam as a base would be very attractive to us at some point. Whether we have a satellite office here working on some of the labs initiatives mm. or we have an incubation fund here, uh, yet to be decided, but you know, Kwobi absolutely does want to be in Amsterdam. Incubation fund will be very perfect fit, I think. Yeah, but, uh, I think so. There's a lot uh, of creativity yeah. here. Mm. Creativity, knowledge, and energy. What we're trying to do with with the Kwobi Lab initiative is incubate the new regime of cryptocurrency technology. I mean, it's mm. it's very ambitious. It's very collaborative. Amsterdam would be a great place to do it. Just uh, a question that uh, personally, it's not actually, it just in general, how does the OTC work actually? I know, I mean, I know it's a, uh, it's, it's a growing business, huh? yeah. the over-the-counter uh, buying, selling of Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies. How, how does it work with you and how is it yeah. actually regulated? I mean, So the best way to think of OTC is, think of it as a digital whiteboard. Mm -hmm. So you've got a whiteboard up there with buys and you've got sells. Mm -hmm. And it gives you the ability to go on this whiteboard and have a look at, let's say you want five Bitcoin. You see someone's advertising for five Bitcoin. You've got the kind of market price there that's derived from our market. So mm -hmm. you know it's fair. You have the ability to match those two together. So you go, I want to buy this. He goes, okay, I'll sell this to you. Match that transaction on there. And it allows you to via a bank transfer to him, then receive the Bitcoin in return. So it's a bit like a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Mm, mm. And the reason we persist with this and keep making our OTC offering better is because for us, it's a key ancillary tool mm. within our exchange infrastructure. So it allows us to have people introduce cryptocurrencies into our crypto to crypto exchange mm. okay. via the OTC marketplace. Mm. So they don't have to fund it in other ways. They can go on the OTC where they can purchase Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever they see fit in their local currency yeah. for 0% commission fees. 0%. So they, 0%. So they can get their hands on cryptocurrencies, which they then transfer from that wallet to their exchange wallet, and it allows them to start trading on the exchange. So for us, it's mm. it's not just a question of, well, it's a nice piece of tool, a nice, nice tool, it's got nice functionality. We're just going to keep it going. No, for us, it's actually a key piece of infrastructure that supports the Huobi Pro network. Do you, uh, do you experience that is growing, this uh, OTC yeah. business? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the OTC business suits different types of participants, whether they are, for example, uh, an institutional client that wants to buy a large amount of cryptocurrency in one go at one strike price and doesn't want to do it on the open market, mm. they can do it there. Or it could be a mum and pop that just want to get two Bitcoin, don't want to go into a two 
oppressive environment where they've got price tickers, market depth and the liquidity, that might confuse them. So it, it, it kind of very nicely meets different participants' requirements. And so that's why for us, we're, you know, we're constantly developing it. We're trying to make it as easy to use as possible. Mm. And launching it in the UK and Europe, I think, is, is the next step. Just a last question. Is it possible to buy via cash? Because I know some, of course, some brokers or parties in the, in the, in the space actually offer you can buy Bitcoin with cash, which obviously you and eh, you need to have a KOL, a KOL, uh, KYC, uh, KYC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so when you say buy by cash, do you do you mean on OTC or exchange? OTC. OTC. Well, you absolutely are buying with with cash. So, mm. let's say I have ten Bitcoin. You want ten Bitcoin. Mm. You will fund your account, or better said, actually, you will bank transfer me to my bank my registered bank account yeah. however much 10 bitcoins costs yeah, yeah. and when i receive it my frozen bitcoin because we've got a match transaction which means i can't do anything with these 10 bitcoins yeah. then get sent to you so we are interchanging cash fiat currency now we do have inbuilt aml rules yeah. we have uh, a source of funds check yeah. we have a uh, aml policy that allows us to get to grips with what's going on internally, how much cash is being sent, what's the source of the funds. So there are various you know, inter interlocking rules within that framework that we use to make sure that no nefarious activity is taking place and that we are absolutely in strict compliance with the AML directives. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your talk and uh, all the best uh, uh, yeah, with, with, uh, with growing this, uh, this, uh, almost, uh, this, uh, yeah, this big exchange already, actually. So, uh, yes, Back thank you. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I will do a little bit of editing. <laughs>